So, our speaker, um, we are honored here to have uh, Shapur Danishman. Uh, please forgive my, my uh, terrible uh, Persian pronunciations, I'll do my best. Uh, Mr. Danishmand is an accomplished producer, director, and international filmmaker with more than 25 years film and video experience. He's the son of a judge and at his core an activist with a keen sense of justice and a passion for giving voice and insight to political and social injustice. An ardent advocate for free speech, transparency, and basic human dignity of a poverty-free world he is called in his life and, as a, uh, and in work as a director, cinematographer, and a gifted storyteller, we should add. To peel away the layers of repression and human suffering through the voice and lens of his camera. His passion for producing and directing is evident in the texture and poignant quality of his broad body of work. You can also see a sampling of his work at uh, decoupagefilm, all one word, dot com. That's D-E-C-O-U-P-A-G-E, -E, decoupagefilm.com. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a happy time to have him here, but the reality is he has lived through and witnessed a great deal of human suffering in, uh, in Iran. And uh, I don't hold any punches, and I don't have any problem with saying that, um, as I said. I, I, we all get to have opinions, and I think that's uh, uh, the, the United Nations has uh, condemned uh, that particular regime for human rights violations. Um, so uh, I, I, you know, I think it's perfectly appropriate to point that out. Um, but we are absolutely delighted that he is here, safe and sound, and has traveled here uh, on his own accord to share some of his uh, his filmmaking on the subject um, with us. So. Please uh, give a very warm welcome to uh, Shapur Danishman for coming here and sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, let's see if uh, you guys can hear me. So um, hi, everyone. Um, since you are all lawyers, I have to make two disclaimers. First, I'm not a speaker. I'm a filmmaker. I love to do it because I'm very passionate about what I'm talking about. The other disclaimer is I'm an immigrant. So all you guys, I know language is very important to you. So bear with me with my accent and my lack of uh, uh, English. So um, today, what I'm trying to do is trying to see if I can inspire some of you to pick up the, um, the torch of being an activist lawyer rather than going and buying a Maserati and all that, which is all good. But uh, if I was just saying that if just 1% of those who graduate as a lawyer could pick up, take up some of these fights that there is, this world would be an amazing world. And of course, remember, this world is an amazing world because of the lawyers. You know, we always say behind a successful man is always a stand of woman. I say behind every human achievement, there's a magistrate. And I come from a home where my father was a judge. He has suffered tremendously because he was always looking after the disfranchised people. There's a quote here. I want you, there's a quiz. <laughs> Tell me who is this uh, quote from. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Thank you. So the reason I brought this is because what I'm going to talk about is an injustice which happens very far from you. But as we saw in 9-11, uh, those problems can be shifted and travel here and hurt us. So its ideal is to fight the issue right there nationally where they belong before they get out of it. And Iran is a center of a lot of issues in the world. I don't want to get into politics, but uh, all I want to tell you is that I want to talk about Baha'is in Iran. How many of you know what Baha'i is? Just few. Baha'i is a religion. It's a brand new religion, about 150, 60 years, uh, 60 years old. It was originated in Iran. Comes out of Islam, trying to go progressive and everything. And because it comes from Islam, has been treated really badly by the Iranian clergy from day one. Now, 
Of course, in 1979, the clergies who used to do all their you know, uh, dirty work through manipulation of the government, the secular government, now they have the government in hand. They are the government. So they start the um, systematic discrimination of the Baha'is in Iran. Now, before I go any further, I do not need to tell you. I have written down here what genocide is, but I don't need to tell you that. You all know what genocide is. And believe it or not, a gen uh, I believe that to, uh, towards the Baha'is in Iran, there has been a systematic genocide happening. And of course, nobody hears about it. So let me tell you the list of things when I talked about the, the discrimination of Baha'is, I want to read to you one by one, what are these discriminations? Let's talk about it. Let's see what they are doing. First of all, in the Constitution, when they started, the revolution happened, they had a brand new Constitution. There was no mention of the Baha'is. They mentioned every minorities, uh, religion minorities, but Baha'is were not there. And that actually became the basis of all the discrimination that followed because they say this is not a, uh, a recognized or official uh, uh, religion. Because they did not recognize it, therefore, all the marriages that it stand within the community and with their tradition and their religion is null. It's not accepted. And their children, therefore, is considered out of wedlock, bastard. The first thing Islamic government did when it, they came to power, all the Baha'is around the country, the Iran is a big country. At that time, there, was, there were 35 million people at that time. All the Baha'is who were working in government agencies, they were thrown out overnight. It doesn't end there. They threw them out without any compensation, whatever they had already uh, uh, gathered for their uh, retirement and whatever, gone. Now, it gets even worse. On many, many occasions, they asked them to pay back all the salaries they got all their lives. And they had to, many of them had to sell their houses to pay back all the salaries that they got throughout their, their lives. A lot of Baha'i children were thrown out of school. A lot of teachers, Baha'i teachers were thrown out of school, professors thrown out of school. And what happened was, just a little fast forward a little bit here, those professors and the teachers who were thrown out of school, they came to people's houses to teach the kids so they will stay educated. Guess what happened? They caught them, they tortured them, and many of them were executed, hanged by rope as young as 16-year-old girl. Teacher who was just left high school, she said, now that I'm not at high school, I'm just going to go and help the kids. At least the kids stay you know, busy and educated. They were left out of work, they cannot work any government, so they have to go and do some work. No business license will be issued to a Baha'i, period. You cannot do it. You cannot open a shop and go and get a license or anything. Now, if you are a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew and you want to give a job to a Baha'i, you will be caught, put into jail and pay fine. So you, as a, even as a, as a citizen, you cannot even help them get a job. So they actually were going through a lot of hardship, uh, because of financial hardship. A lot of Baha'is at that time, they were very fluent, uh, I mean affluent. They picked them one by one, they confiscated all their belongings, and whatever the whole institution had, like uh, churches, offices, lands, schools, they took everything, including the, actually the money that was in the bank. So they left the whole, in go ahead please. How 
was the Baha'i identified? Very good question. I love because the answer to that is the basis of all these atrocities. What they did was, everywhere you go, there is a column with religion you have to check. The problem with Baha'is, from my point of view, is that they cannot lie. <laughs> so they, they, so they, don't, uh, they don't write uh, that I'm not a Baha'i. And they do, and because of that, that's what they get. Baha'is had their own symmetries. You have to understand, Baha'is are very progressive. Baha'is are very industrious. Baha'is are very service oriented. Baha'is like to make heaven on earth. So wherever you go, when there is a Baha'iist place, it is always nice, clean, and beautiful. So they had beautiful symmetries. No more. The symmetries are taken away from them. And when they execute them, they don't let them go to the um, uh, uh, their own cemetery. They created a dump, which they call it uh, the land of infidels, and they, they don't bury them. They dump them into very shallow graves. Some of the people that I know, they used to go and just do this and recognize their dead from their jacket that was buried. So, and what they did, again, gets even better. All the, uh, not only they confiscated the land of their cemeteries, they bulldozered all those graves. So what is happening today when I have been um, interviewing about 170 individuals so far who have been discriminated, their uh, loved ones have been killed, they have gone through hell. Almost 100% of them, there is no graveyard to go to to go and uh, mourn. They don't know where they are. And majority of them, they haven't even seen the body. The bodies have, and some who have seen, is very interesting. If they are executed by firing squad, they deliver it to you, and they charge you for every bullet. So you pay for the bullet because the bullet has to go to them so they can go and kill other people. So, now, as you, we already understood, none of you had heard any of these. And that's why I call it a quiet genocide. The atmosphere was changing. My family were living in fear. The person says, you are a Baha'i, that makes you a guilty. They ransacked our house. They took away what they could. We were worried about my parents very much. We get a telephone call that daddy's gone, just disappeared. My father was a teacher in Esfahan. For two years, he was in hiding. The government was after him, and they were trying to find him. Nazikai zindan ke rasidin jaloy zindan be man gof ke inza negatar. Man negatar zam in azib be khodesh un ehzariye ra be man neshunat. Gof she in ehzariye dadgah engelabe, and man emuz baid khodam inza marfi konam. I got a phone call from my sister. I was like, oh my God, don't tell me that they killed Paris. She, she said, no, they took my father. The Islamic Republic in the early days of the revolution adopted a sort of genocidal policy of exterminating the leadership of the Baha'i community. And it did not hide the purely religious nature of the persecution. <laughs> بودیم رو هم رفته ماها رو کردن اون تو چشما رو بستن و گفتن که هیچ سزایی هم نمی کنون و گویا یکی دو نفرشون هم توی ماشین با ما نشسته بودن They take him to the car He had a four year old son and two year old daughter 
the son goes and holds his leg and cries and says, don't go, Father. The guy that was taking him, he says, don't worry, government will raise your children. من رو پیاده کردن و من شو خوشبختانه شوهرم پلوم نشسته بود با دست از هم دیگه خدافسی کردیم میدونستم من دیگه شوهرم رو نمیبینم خودش هم میدونست Ever since the inception of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Baha'is have been deprived of their basic civil and human rights. The right to life, the right to education, the right to ownership of property. Even they have been deprived of the right to burial. Two times I had a conversation. And one of the pastors said, Why do you not go to America? The children are in America. گفتم من شوهرم تو زندان من برم آمریکا و طولی برگشت گفت اونم دو روز دیگه به درک واسه میشه بلاخره هم کارم کردم بعد از دو روز ایشون رو اعدام کردن خیلی سخته گفتنش هم سخته من تو اداره بودم خواهرم زنگ زد گفت که اگه میتونید بیا خونه چون تمام با هایی رو اعدام کرد اونا که تو زندان بودن As he was walking, he said this poem: "Hargez namirad on ke delash zende shod be ishq sabt as dar jaride alam davam ma." And he would say this as as he was walking in the corridor, going to the gallows. They were buried unceremoniously in very shallow graves in the cemetery that the government had given for the infidels. The pain of losing a parent, it never goes away. لام میخواد که برگردم همون ایران پای پیاده حتی کوچه ها رو بگردم یعنی حد سایمون رو ببینن با که مثلا now you have to understand that a government who does this to the citizen under the name of Baha'i, it won't stop there. Today, in Iran, we have hundreds of thousands of people who have been discriminated, executed, jailed, tortured, raped, anything you can imagine. It's one of the worst countries in the world in terms of human rights. More than 60 times has been condemned by the United Nations. But guess what? It's still there. You know why it's still there? Because they're the darling of the oil cartel. And guess who goes to Congress and White House? What money sends them in is the money from oil. All the lobbyists who work for Iranian government, government they get money from uh, oil, oil companies. Now, the problem is this. In this country, here where we are, we have this um, uh, mainstream media. Majority of our information comes from mainstream media. And that's exactly why you have not heard about this. Now, imagine this may, may, uh, mainstream media in Iran is controlled 100% by Iranian government. So they say exactly what you could write, what you could not write. Even the, the, the seed, they have a ceiling for criti criticism. They give them. You can criticize us, of course. We don't want you to be so benign. But this is where, how, how far you can go. And if you pass a little bit, 
just a little bit, they will catch you, they will put you in um, um, uh, solitary confinement, and they will close your uh, magazine or newspaper, or whatever, completely. And there are hundreds of newspapers in, in Iran today have been closed. So people in Iran has been hearing only with one ear about Baha'is. And because they are putting a lot of pressure on Baha'is, Baha'is are very careful in Iran when they go out and, of course, they have, they have great resolve. They do whatever they, they, they I mean, they're, they're fighting, but still there's a lot of issues. So the Iranians don't know what the Baha'is are going through. I had an assistant who came from Iran three years ago. He hadn't even heard about the Baha'is, and he comes from Iran. And when he was sitting and editing some of these things, he would come out of the uh, studio, go outside and cry. He couldn't take it. He couldn't understand, he couldn't believe it. And he's a Muslim, and he's a very, actually, religious Muslim. He doesn't ag agree with this uh, kind of treatment of these uh, fellow country people. Now, what I'm trying to do is trying to bring these victims. Now, let's talk about victim. From my point of view, through my 170 interviews, my experience has been those who died, who, those who went actually walked to the gallows, they are not victims. And I tell you why. Because they had a choice. It was very simple to get out of it. I mean, all these uh, spies of Zionism, and you're trying to destroy the foundation of the Islamic Republic, all these uh, things that they read to them in their court, suddenly when they were in the interrogation room, we said, look, sign this. Say, I'm not a Baha'i. Go home. Not only you go home, we're going to give you back all your uh, house and your belongings, your car and everything, and even we provide you a nice job and everything. So he had a choice of going to the gallows or just sign a paper saying, I'm not, I'm not a Baha'i, and go and have, and not make their families suffer for the rest of their lives. Because they know when these families when he goes to the gallows, families are penniless in the streets. Last week, I spoke to an 80-year-old woman who, have, who were living in palace in, in Iran. Half of the whole city belonged to them. Overnight, he, she went to see um, the husband in, in jail to tell, her, to tell him that, you know, these people are bothering me. What am I doing with the business? And you know what, what he said? He said, I'm done with business. I'm here, and my destiny is from here to the gallows. It's all yours. I'm done. The person whose everything in his life was about business. When he was there, he was different. And he did walk to the gallows. And that woman, who used to live in a palace, took her eight-year-old daughter with a lot of difficulties and life-threatening situation, walked through the mountains illegally out of Iran. I managed to uh, interview them last week. The girl, by the way, is a lawyer. Wow. A, I mean, this eight-year-old is a lawyer now, and the mom is here. But she came here, and she started ba babysitting to make a living, that kind of. So <clears throat> I think that those who, if you read their, um, uh, their um, wills, you think is a love letter. You know, when someone is going through this kind of, and they have all been tortured, not all, majority of them have been tortured terribly. When you are walking, you know you're going to die. You will never see your eight-year-old, or two-year-old, or five-year-old, or 20-year-old. You know you will never see them again. You should be stressed. Every will that you read is a love letter. And this is what is amazing about these people. They willingly walk to the gallows. You know why? Because me, as an atheist and a non-Baha'i, to come here and not to let the name of every one of those people to be forgotten because they died for everyone in, the, in my country and in the world. Because that's how the world gets to be made. People sacrifice, people pay prices. I mean, in this country that we live such a beautiful life, and I'm an immigrant, and I enjoy every moment. I'm so grateful every moment of my life in this country. This country did not come to this place 
Nothing came in a platter. They have paid huge prices. So that is the price these people are paying for this world to go forward. Now, I am actually bringing this up, and I'm trying to bring these people before this generation passes away. I want them to give the first hand of what has happened. You know, the amazing thing about Holocaust is no genocide, no mass killings ever in the world has been so much photographed and filmed. We don't, I mean, there's a lot of uh, things happen, but we don't have film of it. But because these people, they, they thought they're going to be the king of the world, so they shot everything for their experiment, for their joy, for the whatever. So there, we are left with amazing amount of archival footage. Guess what? People they still deny it. They still deny Holocaust with all that evidence, all that film. So I'm hoping that when we bring these people who have experienced these atrocities firsthand to come and sit in front of camera, I want p Iranian people to see how humble, how res resolved, strong they are. But really, even, the, even these people, which I believe these are the real victims, these are the real martyrs, the ones that are left behind. They don't think of themselves as uh, martyrs, I mean, as um, uh, victims. And you know what? Every time they sit in front of my camera, the moment they get emotional, they said, please just stop the camera. I said, why? I said, I don't, I don't want to cry in front of camera. I said, what's wrong with that? I said, I don't want to show weakness. I said, this is not weakness. This is emotion. It's not weakness. Your husband went to the gallows for nothing. There is no weakness here. This is irony. Revolutionary Guard takes this gentleman from the prison every day to interrogation. Tell them, become Muslim. What is this stupid thing you are doing? Become Muslim, this and that. And they slap him. They slash, uh, uh, put, uh, they destroy them, send them bloody into the thing. All of these things, they do it to them. And then they bring them back again. And they said, come on. You don't want to see your kids? You don't want to see this? You don't, want to you don't want your house? Come on, just, just, just one damn sign. Go and do it. This is the irony. This stupid system, with this puppets of this system, they are telling this man, this is what they are saying, you who have been all your life dedicated man, honest man or woman, because there are many women among the martyrs, who have served the humanity all your life, come and become Muslim so you can become like me, a torturer a killer, a, 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 a selfless, a self, uh, a selfish son of a bitch. That's what I want you to be. This is the irony. And of course, they don't understand that one of the, this actually helps them. I don't want to become like you. <laughs> I'd rather die. And they do die, and they, many of them died. As simple as that. So I want to close this down by telling you that these things happen. First, I would like you to cherish where you are. We immigrants, we cherish this place very much. I know every place has its issues. No place is perfect, but believe me, this country is one of the best countries in the world, and I'm very grateful that I'm here. But we need to take up this fight. You are powerful. There's so much power in you. You are some of the most brilliant people in the world. Just take up some of these fights. I'm really happy that I could share this with you. It was, we were a great audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.